and a very beautiful community. We're going to have a measured conversation about anti-Semitism, which means that if you want to act out, you've got to try to either leave or just control yourself a little bit. I know emotions run high when we talk about the Middle East, Israel and Gaza. We will not talk about it directly today. We will instead say that we'll get there in the next couple of weeks for a refresh, having talked about it a lot about a year ago. But today we're going to look at, in the broadest terms, how you understand what anti-Semitism is and how you diagnose anti-Semitic versus non-anti-Semitic speech. And that'll teach us a lot about other kinds of prejudice. And we'll do a separate talk about Islamophobia. We're trending in a kind of authoritarian right direction in Europe and a white identitarian direction with a heavy dose of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. The United States is similar and different, so unfortunately we'll have too many opportunities to talk about this. Now somebody might say, well Vlad, why do you want to have such a general conversation when the world's on fire and horrific things are happening? Well, having a part of your culture that is consistently engaged in the conversation about making sense of the political world around us is absolutely essential. It's a precondition of anything else. You know, I was in a room once with the philosopher Alistair McIntyre and somebody said, Alistair, you know, how do you feel doing political philosophy and moral philosophy when the world's on fire? How do you experience that? And Alistair said, well, that's a misunderstanding of what I do. What I'm doing uh, isn't aimed at saving the world, right? But nevertheless, a society that wants to react constructively to the challenges it faces needs people doing the sorts of thing that Alistair was doing. Okay, so let, let, let's say we've told ourselves off enough. Let's get on with it. I think straight away I want to put three things on the table that actually apply to other prejudices too and apply to Islamophobia too. So they'll be about anti-Semitism, but actually generic. The first thing is that measured, academic, bureaucratic speech can be prejudicial too, can be anti-Semitic too. So being prejudiced isn't about screaming and shouting necessarily. A lot of the worst things done by human beings have been done in the name of things that were written and said in a measured and um, moderate and bureaucratic or academic tone. So being measured don't mean not being prejudiced. Point number one. Point number two is huge because it's almost never talked about, but you all actually already understand it. That's why it's important to articulate it. And that's that there is no such thing as diagnosing whether prejudice is present or absent ir irrespectively of, apart from the question of what actually is going on in the conflict that people are reacting to. Because what you need to ask is, are you looking at reactions that are just reasonable human reactions by reasonable human beings under the circumstances of that conflict? Or are you looking at something that overreaches this by far? Right? So there is a difference between a Ukrainian soldier, to take a sideways example, in the trench sitting there and saying, these are orcs coming my way and they are also an Asiatic horde. There's a difference between Ukrainian soldiers saying that um, when it's an imperialist war of aggression backed by genocidal rhetoric versus a kind of skirmish between two ex-Soviet states where it's half of one, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other, and nobody's terribly more right or wrong than the other side. That makes a difference. And it also makes a difference whether it's a Ukrainian soldier saying that in the trenches, or whether it's a Ukrainian philosopher saying that in a Western publication, or a Western historian saying it in a Western publication. So understanding the nature of the conflict is essential, right? Um, and having a, a judgment about the proportionality 
of the conflict, the rights and wrongs of the conflict, is an essential precondition of diagnosing prejudice. You can't diagnose it without it, because you need to see if people's speech, if people's emotive, um, hyperventilating extreme speech might not actually be proportionate to the extremes of what is happening, right? So basic question about whether what you're witnessing is how any reasonable human would anyway react to what's happening or whether you're witnessing something much further than that goes much further than that. The third point I want to make that's generic about prejudice is that you can't make accusations of prejudice on the basis of observations about partiality. So let's take an example. In our information environment, somebody like Douglas Murray would go around and say, hey, you people who are criticizing Israel's response to the barbarism of uh, that October, you people criticizing Israel's response are hypocrites because where were you when Assad did terrible things? Why didn't you protest then? And that's an elementary misunderstanding of human moral commitment, an elementary misunderstanding of our ethical economy. We get committed and involved in issues in a way that's a product of, first of all, our cultural and civilizational background, but also on the basis of our experience, our sensibility, and it is a kind of misanthropic utilitarian fantasy if I were to sit here and expect you to have a proportionate response to all the conflicts in the world, in the Middle East and in Africa, um, as well as your response to Ukraine, right? It wouldn't be a fault in your response to Ukraine if I showed you that you're not reacting in a um, uh, commensurate way to something going on um, in Africa. Um, to expect that kind of um, equalization is to expect humans not to be human beings. So the answer to Douglas Murray when he says, where were you when Assad went after his own people is Douglas you speak like that on YouTube, you speak like that on the pages of The Spectator, you will not be allowed to speak like that when you're in a conversation with a serious person. So these are the three generic observations, right, that we've just made um, about measured bureaucratic academic speech, around the interlinking of the analysis of the conflict and the analysis of whether the speech is prejudicial, right? And the third point is about um, this matter of partiality where I have a zero tolerance policy. If you want perfect partiality, um, you're going to need to evacuate the planet uh, uh, with all human beings. Let's move toward specifics of anti-Semitic speech now. And here we run into a very basic question, which is how special, how unique was the the horror of the Holocaust. And that leads to a second question which will dwell, and that's how, how far was the Holocaust unique because the Jewish people are unique? So let's say a tiny word about the first question which we'll rather leave behind, and that's whether the Holocaust was unique not because the Jewish people are unique, but because it was uniquely evil. And here there are two possibilities. You just say that it's an extreme version of other stuff that's happened that's bad stuff. Or you say, no, it's not just an extreme, it's categorically different. And I recommend strongly against going in that direction. And I recommend going against that direction because to land that direction, you would really need to show that in some way the actions of humans who orchestrated this, this historic moral crime were monstrous and somehow outside of the field of thorough human intelligibility that they were incomprehensible motivationally to us, these actions. I don't want to say that. I'm much in favor of the idea of extreme, but not categorically unique at the level of the kind of evil we're looking at. Because then you'd have to sort of um, 
as it were, substitute real explanation with magical thinking. And you don't want to do that. What you instead want to do is give the actual explanation and then realize that it's insufficient. But then you have to say, I don't know. I can't explain it properly. Rather than migrate to the uh, monsters acting outside of the realm of intelligibility did it. But it's the second point that I want us to lean into. And that's that there was something special about Jewish people, something unique about Jewish people that makes the Holocaust unique. That thought can go in two directions, a very, very, very silly direction and a very, very silly direction. So let's start with the many more very silly direction. That's the idea that there's some property that this particular victim group has which makes other human beings, non-Jews, react negatively to that group. And that can work in two ways, either because that's a negative property to which human beings react um, negatively, or it's a neutral or positive property and the fault is with all non-Jewish human beings for reacting to that property. And I want to say that that's an absurd direction in which to go. The second direction in which you can go is a direction that has gone in a lot. I would even argue it's the mainstream pop understanding of anti-Semitism. And it's an elementary bit of sort of psychological facetiousness. It's not even a starter explanatorily, but it's how most people conceive of anti-Semitism. And that is as a kind of item in the human psyche that presumably by some bizarre evolutionary process stabilized in the psyche and emits itself at inopportune historical moments. That's such a bad argument, it's less bad than the first argument perhaps we've named, but it's such a bad argument that to explain why it's there, you need not an explanation of the error in it, but a sociological, not epistemological, a sociological explanation of what kinds of things make this argument persist. Right, And so one thing that obviously makes this argument persist is a desire to clamp down on criticism of Israel um, by elevating anti-Semitism into a kind of a unique psychic property. Now, it can't be that because no human prejudice can't be, can be that. Islamophobia can't be that. So what is anti-Semitism then? Well, I've jotted it down, so for health reasons, I'll just read this. Anti-Semitism is an expression of destructive human aggression, dark impulses and emotions, expressed under particular cultural conditions in association with thoughts about Jewish people. So the psychological dynamism that stimulates this reaction is not the anti-Semitism as an item in the human psyche, but it is fundamental capacities of human aggression that are, by long-distance sustenance of cultural circumstances, associated with prejudicial thoughts about Jewish people. Let's say something now about speech, anti-Semitic speech. To begin to understand whether speech is anti-Semitic, you need to understand two things. Number one, you need that psychic understanding, right? Is this aggressive impulse at work in that person? Which is to say, you need an understanding not just of what they say, but what they mean and what they feel behind what they say. Second understanding you need is an understanding of the particular conflict at hand. And you need a judgment about what is and what is not proportionate in that conflict. What is and what is not a moral crime in that conflict. What is and what is not an ultimate horror. You need to weigh and judge that conflict. So you can't actually give an account of anti-Semitism 
without giving a political interpretation that's well judged about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, about the Israel-Gaza war now. You cannot detach the two. Again, for the obvious reason that um, when we ask what are reasonable human reactions, it makes a vast difference whether Israel responds to the barbarism of that October with action that takes the lives of 400 folks in Gaza versus 40 plus thousand. These things are absolutely going to make a difference to how reasonable humans would engage in speech in response to what's happening, particularly if they're involved somehow, uh, but even if they're not. So you need an understanding of what's psychically going on with the person, and then you need an understanding of the conflict, a balanced understanding of the conflict. And I won't legislate on what that is today. We have a separate conversation about that. If you're waiting for that, um, it'll you know, we'll do it soon. Um, so don't, you know, don't disinhibit yourself more than is necessary with just statements about what's happening. That this is not what we're trying to do in this room today, right? I, I'm not can't control you, right? But I'm telling you, this is this is not um, where we are giving space to that. It's going to be another conversation. And this means that it's a deeply interpretive question whether anti-Semitic speech is occurring because it requires a psychic interpretation and it requires a political interpretation of a conflict at hand. As a rule, what I want to say is it's important to try to be as slow as possible at taking fair criticism of Israel and then excessive criticism of Israel too um, as anti-Semitic speech. So let's look at, at this in a little bit more detail. I think there are three categories of discussion that I'm going to raise that I won't legislate on them today. One is is the Israeli state legitimate and how legitimate is the Israeli state? Now, I happen to recommend the view that you accept the legitimacy of the Israeli state. Um, and that's compatible with the most vehement criticism of what Israel is doing, the most vehement criticism of what's happening outside of the Green Line, the most vehement criticism of Gaza. doesn't matter. That's one question. Another question is um, how deeply sh is it... Uh, uh, okay to criticize what the Israeli governments do. The third question is how far can the memory of the Holocaust itself be involved as um, yeah, involved, deployed, invoked as part of a critique of what the Israeli government is doing. Right? So th th these are points about how far Israel gets or doesn't get to own the Holocaust politically. So I'm going to say that um, a plethora of views on, on these questions, including reasonable views and unreasonable views, should not be taken as anti-Semitic. It's also possible, of course, that Palestinians have reason to express out of political expedience views that may be unreasonable. Sure, many critics of Israel will be anti-Semitic and their positions may be inflected with anti-Semitism. But we should be slow to constitutively associate, I'm just repeating myself because it's important, criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. And that includes excessive criticism of Israel. Right? You might say, well, how can, how can criticism of what's happening in Gaza be excessive? You know, does it get worse than this? Well, yes, there's always worse, and so there is always room to be excessive. But I'm saying that even excessive criticism, you should be very slow about linking with anti-Semitism unless there are grounds to do that. And it works the other way around. Very fair criticism of Israel can itself be anti-Semitic too. It can itself come in a package of anti-Semitic speech. So we've got to be very slow about making that association. So lots of positions on the Middle East, on the Israeli-Palestinian 
conflict on Israel-Gaza. A lot of positions, reasonable and unreasonable, don't have to be anti-Semitic. But what I have just said is insufficient to cover political speech. And notice I've tried to not say that I'm talking about political speech. Let's talk a little bit more about political speech. And what comes in here is a really important realization about the unbelievable literal mindedness of political speech which creates a problem for my story about how you've got to pay attention to what's psychically going on in a person. In politics, that becomes a kind of nuttiness if you do that too much. So that means that um, we have to permit the absurd literal mindedness of politics to enter into how we categorize anti-Semitism politically, which means you always have to have two conceptions one for non-political discourse or less explicitly political discourse and the other for political discourse. The same goes with other issues, um, racial issues, United States, for instance, right? There's a difference between a public conception of racism and a private conception of racism. Now, that means that we have to create room for the anti-Semitic remark even if it's not backed by the aggressive impulse we discussed. As a result, two conclusions follow. In a sense, right, the standard for what we t take anti-Semitic speech in politics to be needs to be both weaker and stricter. It needs to be weaker because you don't want to play around with faint anti-Semitism in politics. You, want to, you don't want to call out fa faint anti-Semitism in politics um, the way you might do in private life. It's just not clear enough, right? These differences need to be clear, like a football that you can throw around very roughly. They can't have very fine, fragile distinctions dependent on, you know, a lot of interpretation. It also has to be stricter, though. Stricter because in politics you just have to count some things which sound anti-Semitic as anti-Semitic even though they're not. Even though they might not be at the level of that psychic analysis of what's going on in somebody's head. So that doesn't answer your question of what is or what isn't anti-Semitism, but I think it gives you Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if this was useless. It gives you much richer resources than the sort of fare you typically get in our public discourse, which is it's either anti-Semitism or it's a proportional criticism of Israel. I think you need a lot more um, scaffolding to help you make sense of a prejudice like this. And so I've tried to do that today a little bit. Now, while we're terrible with anti-Semitism in Europe, we're also terrible with Islamophobia. And in some ways, Islamophobia is conceptually even harder to grasp than anti-Semitism. So we'll talk about that in the next prejudice chat that we have. Thank you for surviving this and lots of love till next time.